When the modern Olympic Games were revived in 1896, women were perfectly welcome as spectators. At the turn of the century, British women still had no automatic right to inherit property, no right to divorce on the grounds of adultery, and no right to vote. But on the playing fields of Victorian England, the game was on, and the goal was equality. There were schools like Rodine, Cheltenham Ladies College, the North London Collegiate. They wanted to play games like their brothers. The girls played hockey, lacrosse, cricket, and because the pioneering headmistress of the time introduced games to the curriculum, they really contributed to young women taking part in the Olympic Games today. As these girls became women in the late 1890s, they formed societies like the Ladies Golf Union and the Hockey Association of Scotland. Women were playing sport in public. The corset was being loosened. And in the Paris Games of 1900, for the very first time, they had a chance to shine. Admittedly, only 2% of the total entrants were women and they were only allowed to compete in golf and tennis. But the point was made. Women were beginning to make more demands, both in the political arena, they were, they were fighting for the vote. And I think the last bastion was to be accepted in the, in, in the world of sport. They weren't going to be invited in by the IOC, so they had to push their way forward. The progressive trickle of Paris showed little sign of becoming a flood. In St. Louis in 1904, just six women competed, and it wasn't until 1912 that any female swimming events were introduced. It would take a truly seismic event to rock the sporting establishment and the world at large. The eruption of World War in 1914 proved a catalyst for social change. In England, millions of women were drafted into the workforce, from the civil service to agriculture and even shipbuilding. In a state of emergency, women had earned a new role in society and sport was at the heart of the action. Between 1918 and 1939, more than 150 women's football teams were formed in Britain some attracting massive popular support. The Great Dick Kerr's Ladies football team was watched by thousands and thousands of people on, on FA, on Football Association uh, grounds. Women were doing more athletics and uh, swimming and, and all sports. Things had changed irrevocably and I think it was no way back after that. But the participation of women at the Olympics, that was still a rarity. Just 65 of the 2,626 competitors in the post-war Antwerp Games were women. You know, the Olympic movement over the years has usually been forced to change. In the 20s in particular, women were looking for emancipation across the board. Um, but I think the Olympic movement wasn't quite ready for it yet. Less than a month after British women finally gained voting equality, the 1928 Amsterdam Olympic Games began featuring, for the very first time, five women's athletics disciplines. 16-year-old Betty Robinson won the 100 metres to become the first female Olympic track champion. Meanwhile, the 800 metres final got underway in the heat of the Dutch summer. The record shows that Germany's Lena Radke won the gold medal, but the focus of many was elsewhere. The Daily Mail said there were sobbing girls, all the women collapsed, uh, and, and it was a terrible sight, but it's just not true. This was the testimony of one finalist, American Florence MacDonald. I think the girls who won the race did okay, but this collapsing business, that was a lot of nonsense. Sport was controlled by men, and it was controlled by men of certain parts of society, and the reaction to seeing women out in the sporting arena was, um, this isn't ladylike. And it was, it was much more about that than it was about um, worrying about their health. I think that was a red herring, if you like. The IOC decreed that women could not or should not run such distances. They were banned from competing beyond 200 metres until the Rome Olympics of 1960. The Olympic superstars of the 1930s were lauded for their physicality and achievements rather than their novelty. And the Americans were setting the pace. There was a double gold medalist, Mildred Didrikson, an imperious presence on the track. 
Helene Madison, the first woman to swim the 100-yard freestyle in under a minute, and the supreme Helen Stevens, never beaten over any sprint distance. And then in 1939, the world went dark again. The Second World War not only changed the course of history, but also the course of women's lives. In emergency, they had led the way, and post-war, they wanted to maintain the sense of responsibility. And in 1948, a 30-year-old mother of two from Utrecht came to embody that ethos. Fanny Blankers Kern had spent the Second World War in Nazi-occupied Holland, breaking six track world records between 1942 and 1944. But her arrival at the London Games had a mixed response. She was criticised and received letters from people saying she should not leave her children, she should be home looking after them. She had a hard time in being accepted as equal. The critics soon revised their views as the so-called flying housewife stormed to gold in four of the nine women's events. Once more, Blanker's Coon comes through in sensational style. And there was one last surprise for the naysayers. When her third child was born in 1949, it became clear that Blanca's Cohen had competed in London while pregnant. 1940s austerity gave way to 1950s prosperity, and things were changing for Western women. In America, 35% of adult females were in employment by 1956, and that was also the year of the first ever Australian Olympics, where in Melbourne, they celebrated the free-spirited Dawn Fraser. Uh, speak out my mind, I'm not afraid to say that I don't like something. I don't do anything that I don't want to do. The working class Fraser proved that sport could be for all. Governing bodies, institutions, management, well, that was different. Men still dominated the IOC, who wouldn't have a female member until 1981. And as a result, there was a lost generation of sportswomen. Diane Leather is a great example of how women missed out on being Olympians as a result of the 1928 ban. She was the first woman in the world, a British athlete, to run under five minutes for the mile. And she did that around the same time as Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile. And yet who's heard of her? Who knows of her achievement? By the 1960s, times were changing. It wasn't just about sex, drugs and rock and roll. This was the era of demonstration, of civil unrest and of women's lib. The advent of the contraceptive pill meant that women could control their own fertility and therefore their own destiny. As feminism forged forward, so too did British sportswomen on the Olympic stage. First, it was Anita Lonsborough, a teenage corporation clerk from Huddersfield. I was 19 and 16 days, I think it was, when I went there. And to me, it was a bit of a, a dream, really. I never really thought about winning. I just, but I never thought about losing. I just wanted to go in and do my best. Lonsborough's best was good enough for gold and the world record. She touches first! Lonsborough has the gold medal! When I came back, Huddersfield, had a civic reception for me. There was ladies in the front actually crying. I just couldn't believe how much it meant to other people. You don't realise it at the time, and you're breaking these barriers down for women. Um, but as you look back, you realise, yes, you know, we were doing something right at the time. Lonsborough wasn't the only focus in 1960. Fellow Yorkshire woman Dorothy Hyman took silver in the 100 metres and a bronze in the 200 metres. To Tokyo in 1964, Anne Packer's 800 metres victory had been a surprise, but for the press, she was the plucky outsider, triumphing against the odds to claim the first athletics gold medal ever won by a British woman. Anne Packer's going to take the gold medal! It's Anne Packer, Great Britain! If Packer was the media's underdog story, Mary Rand represented a different obsession. She was the perfect combination of power and beauty and became the first woman to leap over 22 feet. Mary Rand stands poised to jump her way into Olympic history. Oh, a beautiful jump. It looked to me like the first 22-footer ever by a woman. Rand was the ideal subject for the burgeoning tabloid newspapers. When she found a celebrity admirer in 1965, her pop culture credentials were complete. I understand that Mick Jagger was asked, you know, if he could take someone on a date, 
who would he take? And he said, me. When you see footage, black and white, of the 60s, you think, yeah, I was part of that, you know. These Golden Girls were genuine pioneers for female athletes, and they had a huge profile, driving TV audiences and newspaper circulation. They were also hugely popular, and Anita Lonsborough became the first woman to be voted Sports Personality of the Year in 1962, closely followed by Dorothy Hyman and Mary Rand. There was a growing appetite for women's sport, but the battle now was to be taken seriously. And in this battleground, there was no greater warrior than Billie Jean King. She'd already won 10 Grand Slam singles titles, when in 1973, she took on former Wimbledon champion Bobby Riggs in the so-called Battle of the Sexes. Fifty million people saw King win the battle. It connected women's sport to women's rights. Sport was affecting society. I wanted to change people's attitudes with that match against Bobby Riggs. I wanted us never to look back after that. I wanted people to really, particularly girls, to believe in themselves. As for the golden girl generation, Mary Peters was keeping the spirit alive. Now, come on, Mary, you need the run of your lifetime. When I was sort of seven, eight, nine watching athletics, and she was a big part of the British team. You didn't think, oh, it's a woman. You know, you're just a great athlete. In Montreal in 1976, women's handball, rowing and basketball were added to the Olympic programme and a woman achieved the impossible, perfection. There it is, 10 Olympic history for Nadia Comaneci. By the 1980s, women were reading the news and they were the news. The dramas of the female players on the Olympic stage were just as compelling. The rivalry of Fatima Whitbread and Tessa Sanderson. The acrimony of Zola Budd and Mary Decker. And the incredible exploits of Florence Griffiths Joyner. After nearly a century of Olympic competition, this was also the decade that finally delivered the holy grail for female athletes, the marathon. By then, you already had great marathon runners kicking around. And Greta Weitz was the person who'd been leading the way, if you like. And it wasn't as though they could argue, oh, the standard isn't very good yet. The standard was very, very good. 90,000 people greeted Joan Benoit's victory in Los Angeles, a win that was nearly 100 years in the making. By the 1990s, sport was big business. Advertising, sponsorship, marketing, all meant that your body was your brand. And for women in particular, that meant that what it looked like was just as important as what it could do. Women and women in sport are judged on how they look. It's not right. Um, we only have to look at the magazine covers to see what type of women make it on the front cover. You know, we're happy to have you somewhere on page 108, but no, that sort of body image is not quite for our front cover. 1984 saw the first woman from an Islamic nation win an Olympic medal. And this is a goal for Morocco. Oh, no, Morocco wins. Since then, there has been slow evolution rather than rapid revolution. The inclusion of female athletes from Saudi Arabia, Brunei and Qatar for the very first time in London is a positive step, but several Muslim countries still repress sporting participation for women at home. The inclusion of women's boxing in London offers parity in sporting terms with men. It's been a long road to Olympic equality. 42% of competitors in Beijing were women. London is hoping for the magic 50. I've already seen athletics change in my lifetime and I'm now seeing the opportunities that are available for, for women if they choose to go down that route, if they choose a life in sport. And I think that's a great thing. Women have made great strides in society and particularly in the Olympic Games. But there's still a long, long way to go, particularly as coaches and on the, the, the governing bodies and the international federations. These are the places where women have got to, got to appear so that they can make much more progress. By the end of these games, the chances are that the British Medal Hall will have been dominated by women. 
And what will matter to them is not their gender or their appearance, but purely the quality of their performance. And that is a positive and powerful message, not just to women in the pool, on the track or in the saddle, but to women in every environment.